a memorable moment from when I was Surgeon General. I was um, in the green room of an event with Bill Clinton. And we had both been warned not to talk to one another because I was Trump's Surgeon General and he was Bill Clinton. And we had both been warned, do not let anyone take a picture of the two of you together. And of course, both Bill Clinton and I are very social people and we find ourselves right next to one another. And what are we talking about? We're talking about our daughters. He's talking about Chelsea. I'm talking about my daughter, Millie. And I pull out my phone and I show him a picture of my eight-year-old daughter in the White House. She'd fallen asleep on this 200-year-old couch underneath Bill Clinton's official portrait. And I'm showing him that picture on my phone and someone snapped a picture of us in that moment. And I absolutely love that picture because it makes the point that no matter how different people try to make you feel that you are from someone else, there will always be more that you have in common than there ever could be that will separate you if you only look for it. This is Real Pharma, your podcast for real conversations with pharma pathfinders. In every episode, you will hear from an industry insider who has a story to share that goes beyond the headlines. No spin, no sacred cows, no hidden agendas, just stories and the people behind them. Now, here are your hosts, Dr. Nari O oh and Ian Wint. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Real Pharma podcast. I'm your host, Nari O, oh, along with the irrepressible Ian Wint, and today's episode is one you won't want to miss. We are honored to have a guest whose career has been nothing short of extraordinary in the realm of public health, Dr. Jerome Adams. As the 20th U.S. Surgeon General and the prior member of the President's Coronavirus Task Force, Dr. Adams has been at the forefront of America's most pressing health challenges. He's also a regular contributor to the public discourse via TV, radio, and in print. Dr. Adams is an expert not just on the science, but also in communicating that science to the public and making it relevant to this audience. Dr. Adams is a licensed anesthesiologist with a master's degree in public health and ran the Indiana State Department of Health prior to becoming Surgeon General. In a state health commissioner role, he managed over a thousand employees and led Indiana's response to Ebola, Zika, and the HIV crisis. Notably, Dr. Adams helped convince the governor and state legislature to legalize syringe service programs in the state and to prioritize $13 million in funding to combat infant mortality. As Surgeon General, Dr. Adams was the operational head of the 6,000-person Public Health Service Commission Corps. Dr. Adams was appointed as a presidential fellow and the executive director of Purdue University's Health Equity Initiatives in 2021. He's also a distinguished professor of practice at Purdue in the Departments of Pharmacy Practice and Public Health. Today, he joins us to discuss his latest book, Crisis and Chaos, Lessons from the Front Lines of the War Against COVID-19, that offers an inside look into managing public health emergencies and the role pharma played in this battle. We look forward to our conversation and to gaining some valuable insights from a true leader in healthcare, Dr. Jerome Adams. Welcome to the show, Dr. Adams. Well, it is really great to be here with you and Ian today, and uh, I apologize for that long introduction. You must have gotten my mother's version, but uh, <laughs> I'm really excited to explore some of the topics that you brought up. And, uh, you know, my, my past history, I think, had a lot of influence on the things that I prioritized and the people who I tried to speak up on behalf of during the pandemic. So I do appreciate you, you covering some of that. Absolutely. I think this was really the Cliff Notes version. We could have gone much longer with your introduction, Dr. Adams. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for your time. I know we're catching you just coming out of the OR. You're obviously a busy person, and we really do appreciate the time you've carved out for us. And, and I think our audience will uh, as well. As I mentioned to you, as we were kind of getting ready for this discussion, you know, our audience is primarily pharma industry professionals. And so one area I, th I thought would be good to kind of focus on up front is Operation Warp Speed. And, and the reason for that is it's such a notable and important collaboration between the public and private sector that delivered some really amazing results that we all benefited from. And it's been a little while, maybe since we've talked about Operation Warp Speed, or I'm going to shorten it to OWS, but I'd like to just go through the timelines a little bit so we all just understand really how amazing this was and, and what an accelerated approval process we were able to deliver on. So April 29th, 2020, uh, there was the first news report of OWS. So we're 45 days or so into what we had identified at that point as the pandemic. 
by May 15th, there's an official announcement of OWS by the administration. So just 15 days later, by the end of June, the FDA had announced that a vaccine must at least be 50% effective in diminishing COVID-19 symptoms for approval. So they've set the goal that these companies are working towards. And by July, several vaccine candidates and technologies started receiving government funding. By August, the next month, funding agreements were in place with J&J, Moderna, and other companies for vaccine development. And then by December of that same year, 2020, an EUA or emergency use authorization was issued for Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. And in January, OWS was restructured and renamed under the new administration. By February, responsibilities were transferred to the White House COVID-19 response team. OWS was originally funded with about $10 billion from the CARES Act. This was an interagency program that included collaboration between the Departments of Health and Human Services, so DHHS, the CDC, FDA, NIH, BARDA, Department of Defense, and then a variety of private firms. So a huge undertaking. It's something that maybe had never been done at that level or certainly at that speed and delivered what we had all been hoping for the whole time in record time. So Certainly, there might be rooms for criticism on the public side and the private sector side, things we could do better, and that's okay. But I think maybe we can all agree that when the next crisis occurs, if another pandemic occurs, this type of collaboration will be important in the future. So I really wanted to call that out and get your perspective on that. And for somebody that was kind of boots on the ground during it, you know, what was that like? And, and, and give us a little insight behind the curtain of that whole process. I really appreciate you bringing that up because with all the political bickering and back and forth, I think we've lost sight of a lot of the positive things that we can build upon that come out of the pandemic. And Operation Warp Speed is absolutely one of those positives. I truly believe, and I would challenge anyone to suggest otherwise, that it is the greatest public health achievement and one of the greatest policy achievements, certainly one of the most life-saving policy achievements of the last 50 years in this country and on this planet. When I say I would challenge anyone uh, to say otherwise, when you look at June of 2020, both Tony Fauci and Bill Gates are on record as saying it would still be 12 to 18 months minimum before we would have a viable vaccine to put in arms. We had a vaccine literally by the end of that year because of Operation Warp Speed. Lancet suggests that there were over 10 million lives saved because of the availability of that vaccine in the first couple of years. And so if we had been on the timeline that one of the, you know, world's greatest virologists and one one of the world's smartest men predicted, we would have lost millions of additional lives. So Truly a great public health achievement, number one. Another thing, as you were going through that, it was interesting because a couple of things popped out to me. You highlighted that the FDA originally set the bar at 50% efficacy. And why that is, I think, important for us to discuss and to remember is you now have folks saying, oh, those COVID vaccines don't work. They're terrible. Those boosters don't work. They're only 60% effective. They're only 75% effective. And it's important to remember truly not just the speed, but how amazing it was that we had vaccines that were that highly affected. And the challenge that we actually have now is that the bar was set so high initially by success under previous thoughts is something that's now considered a failure. (laughs) And so I really am not only proud of my involvement with Warp Speed, I think the people who, who were the boots on the ground the people who were in the labs, the people who were working um, in private industry who took a chance, the folks who are the worker bees in government don't get the appreciation and respect that they deserve. I also, when I'm talking to students, I remind them that, that we actually have had similar things happen before, and they've come during times of war, in times of distress. So the the operation, the first Operation Warp Speed in this country was uh, in World War II when they massively scaled up the production of penicillin because people were getting war wounds and they were actually dying of war wounds. World War I, we actually saw massive improvements in transfusion therapy. So before that, people were just bleeding out on the battlefield. And so war and crisis spurs change. It spurs innovation. If we can take that innovation and really scale up the good 
then we have the potential to save many, many more lives in the future as we have with transfusion therapy. And I literally was in the operating room today transfusing someone with blood. That is thanks to the lessons learned from World War I. I literally gave multiple patients antibiotics intraoperatively to prevent postoperative infections. That is in large part due to the innovation from World War II. And my hope is that in the future, we will continue to save lives because of Operation Warp Speed. You're already seeing potential for cures for sickle cell disease because of the mRNA technology and the, uh, and the partnerships that came out of Operation Warp Speed. So I don't want to belabor that, but I do want to talk about one particular aspect of Warp Speed that folks don't n- often know about and which I highlight in my book and which I'm particularly proud of, but it's also something that we need to continue to build upon. We went from June, Tony Fauci and Bill Gates saying 12 to 18 months, no vaccine, to getting called to the White House in August and being told that we had viable candidates that might be ready to put into people within a few weeks. And we, we were looking at the early participation in trials. And one of the first questions I asked is, what do the demographics look like? And we had literally about 4% participation from non-white people, from diverse populations in August of 2020. And I sat down with Tony Fauci and with Dr. Collins, Dr. Francis Collins, the director of NIH. And I said, you know, and we had a real moral dilemma there. And the moral dilemma was, do we slow down these trials to increase participation, knowing that literally every day we slow down the trial could be thousands, tens of thousands of lives lost. You know, we were at peak pandemic at that point. Or do we forge ahead and get a vaccine as soon as possible while knowing that the people who are most likely to contract and to die from COVID would also be the people who'd be least likely to trust a vaccine that wasn't made with them involved in the trials? And so what we said was, let's really push this as hard as we can. And Tony and Francis and I met with the the manufacturers on a weekly basis, sometimes twice weekly from that point on. And we finished Operation Warp Speed with over 30% participation from, uh, from diverse populations. So Operation Warp Speed was not only the fastest, not only the largest development of a new drug in history, but it was also the most diverse trials in history. And so one of the things I'm involved with now is actually the Association of Diversity in Clinical Trials. I'm the president or uh, board chair of the Association of Diversity in Clinical Trials. And it's because we've proven that we can actually do this. We've talked about it for decades. I worked for Eli Lilly over uh, 25 years ago, and we were talking about increasing diversity in clinical trials. And we always talk about it, but then when the rubber meets the road, we go, eh, we tried. We could only get up to 3%. <laughs> we could only get up to 5%. You know, and, and we don't want to deny the, the public these life-saving medications, so let's just move ahead. Well, this showed that it could be done. And you saw that even going into the Biden administration, CMS changed their roles to encourage more participation in clinical trials. And the FDA now actually has out draft guidance and is calling upon companies to actually have a diversity plan to make sure when they're um, approving products that the trials have representation that is representative of the burden of disease in society. I love this this topic because I think it's one that, as you mentioned, as an industry, we've struggled with for decades. Two questions here. Number one, how that late in the development of the vaccines did they course correct to get it from 4% to 30% representation? And is that all transferable? And it sounds like that's a lot of the work that you do in your board chair seat in helping companies perhaps do a better job there. Because I've been in those meetings where companies are kind of wringing their hands because they're they're not representing the general population and trying to figure out ways to do that. And I believe that they are certainly well-intended to, to try to achieve those goals. But the reality is many of them come up short. So what's needed and what's the difference in Operation Warp Speed that they were able to hit that 30%? Well, first of all, you've got to believe you can do it. <laughs> and um, all due respect to folks out there who've been in this space for 20 years, I don't think we believed we could do it. We thought of it as an important goal, but far too often we just said, eh, you know, we did the best we could and really believed that that was the best that we could do. So now we've proven that it can be done, number one. Number two, there has to be intentionality and accountability. 
And what I mean by that is you literally had the uh, NIAID director, the head of NIH and the Surgeon General meeting with these companies on a weekly basis saying, tell me what happened this week. Tell me why you were able to move your numbers at this site, but you weren't able to move your numbers at that site. And we were course correcting in real time. I think that is a obviously a high bar. You're not going to be able to have Tony Fauci and the Surgeon General and the NIH director available for every trial. But that's where the FDA comes in and you start to say, okay, we need companies to have a plan in the beginning. We need to have some accountability. We need to make sure people are stopping at regular checkpoints. And the FDA is ultimately you know, now saying, hey, we're not going to approve your medication. We're not going to approve your device if you don't have adequate representation. But I think another point, and this is something we focus on in the Association of Diversity and Clinical Trials, is you've got to get involved in the community. You can't just show up when you need to stick someone in the arm with, with an experimental drug and think that they're going to be like, okay, hey, yeah, sign me up. You've got to do the groundwork. You've got to really invest in churches and in schools, answering people's questions. One of the things we had, we started off talking about how crisis spurs change. One of the advantages we had with COVID was the entire world was watching. The entire world was invested in getting this vaccine across the finish line. And so you had a willingness on the part of people to participate in trials because they saw that there would be a benefit if these trials were able to get to completion earlier and if they had had diversity in them. In many cases, again, companies show up in communities and they haven't made the value proposition to the community by, by showing up beforehand. They think, hey, this company, yeah, they want me so that they can get their product approved so they can make money, but how's it helping me? How's it helping my community? And I think if we do a, a little more legwork up front to build that trust, then you'll see people participate in trials. One of the things I highlight, and I don't even think folks know this at the highest levels within industry, is when you participate in a clinical trial, even if you get the placebo, your health status consistently goes up. Why? Because you're getting screenings, you're getting lab tests. In order to participate in a trial, we have to make sure you are getting the standard of care for everything else that is being offered for your disease at the moment. So you're getting the best drugs. And if we can explain that to communities, then I think you'll get more participation in trials also. So can we expand on that a little bit? So you're obviously focusing your work at Purdue University on health equity initiatives, and you just mentioned the importance of diversity in clinical trials. But beyond that, for general healthcare access outcomes, and we know there are still problems and disparities there, what are some of the critical steps and who should take them? It sounds like, again, you need really a partnership here, but what, what do you think are the, the key steps here to rapidly improve? I want to see if I can distill down a lecture that I give to my students into about two minutes. Uh, Martin Luther King famously said of all injustices, inequality in healthcare is the most shocking and the most inhumane. That's one of his most famous quotes. And it really is jarring if you think about the fact that this is a man who was at the peak of the civil rights era, literally a target. This was someone who was assassinated. And he said that of all injustices, inequality in healthcare is the most shocking and the most inhumane. He said that 60 years ago. He could have said it today and it would be just as true. However, we need to update that. We need people to understand, number one, that inequality is not the same as inequity. You can't give everyone the same thing and expect that they're going to have equal outcomes. We have to give people what they need. And as an example, I often talk about someone who is uh, differently able. They may need a wheelchair and a ramp to get in the building. We don't give a wheelchair to everybody, but we make sure people who need it can have access to what they need to be able to participate in society, participate in work, participate in school. So equity is incredibly important. And it's simply just making sure people have what they need so that they can make healthy choices. That's number one. But number two, healthcare isn't health. One of the things I'm trying to help people understand is that 80% of your health happens outside of a hospital or a doctor's office. It has to do with transportation. It has to do with safe and affordable housing. It has to do with access to affordable and nutritious foods. If we build healthier communities, we will actually see our health status improve. Final point that I want to make is a, about a report that I put out when I was Surgeon General called Community Health and Economic Prosperity. And this report highlighted uh, 
the economic case for health. The fact that when you have poor health in a community, whether it's due to substance misuse or suicides or COVID outbreaks or high rates of obesity and cancer, it becomes not just an individual health issue, but a societal workforce issue. Think about the last time you went out to a restaurant. Oftentimes, the restaurant opens uh, later or closes earlier, or you can't get prompt service because we're in a workforce crisis right now. Then that's something that's tangible for people, but it's happening in every field. We need to make sure we're promoting good mental and physical health so that we can be economically competitive. And so at Purdue and in Indiana, uh, we are really working to make that case, and we've been successful. There was a political article about the fact that we were able to increase our public health funding in Indiana, a very conservative state, by 1,500% in our last leg- legislative session. And we did it not by making the health case. We did it by making the economic and workforce case for investing in public health. Thank you for that. And I really like one comment you made. This is a, maybe a lesson for pharma that we can't just show up when we want something or need something from a group of patients because we're trying to get a trial done cost effectively and quickly and hit all the endpoints that are important to us and then move on, right? That doesn't resonate with probably any communities, but certainly many are not going to view that as particularly welcoming or collaborative. A few episodes ago, we had on Dr. Arthur Kaplan, who's a bioethicist out of NYU, and he actually touched on this and really touched on, are there ways that we could ethically incentivize patients to participate more, right? And, and I think there's something there that we need to figure out. And that's not a complete solution, but it might be one step in the right direction to make sure that patients don't feel like I'm just showing up because it's important to the pharma company and not to me. Where's my self-interest? I mean, it's okay to have self-interest as a patient. We all care about our health. And I think your point is a good one. And I think it is something that we need to kind of think about and maybe do a little bit better. The question here is, though, is that something that, that pharma should be doing independently and figuring out on its own? Or where I'm, my head is going is that really this is probably an opportunity for a more collaborative approach with the public sector. Because obviously there's a lot of infrastructure there already serving many of these communities and pharma needs to leverage that. And I wonder if, if that's kind of a little bit of what OWS represents or Operation Warp Speed and if that's a good model moving forward in general. Well, public-private partnerships are absolutely a good model. That's Operation Warp Speed. Community engagement is going to be key for companies to be successful. And one of the things I think about are the diabetes medications. We can wait for someone to get diagnosed with diabetes. I, again, was in the hospital today and diagnosed someone with diabetes when they were coming in for an operation. But that's the medical model that I talked about that is continuing to fail us. We're not going to be able to treat our way out of our our country's poor health status. What we really need to do is treat the people who need to be treated, but we also need to get into the community and prevent disease. I'm in Indianapolis. I will tell you that Eli Lilly has done a much better job over the last several years and made a concerted effort to focus on diabetes prevention so that people don't think, hey, you actually want me to get sick because you make more money when I get sick. We want companies to understand They've got to show up and prevent cancer, prevent diabetes, prevent hypertension, even as they're developing better drugs to treat it on the back end. Something that that we haven't talked about yet, but that's also important, is we've got to think about pricing models. So I was the chair of our pharmacy and therapeutics committee at my hospital when the hepatitis C medications came out. And I work at a county hospital. This was before the Affordable Care Act. And so we had a lot of no-pay patients, but we had a policy that if we put it on our formulary, we're going to make it available to everybody, which is different than other hospitals where they say, hey, you know, we'll put it on formulary. And if, if Anthem covers it, you know, and you've got Anthem, great. If Medicare covers it, great. If Medicaid doesn't cover it, it's too bad. Sorry about your luck. Our policy was if it was on our formulary, we'll make it available to everyone. And so you have these new medications that can literally cure a disease which can be debilitating and deadly in the long run. But these medications cost $50,000 each. We had quite the back and forth about the ethics of saying no versus the ethics of saying yes, because you say yes to one person getting $50,000 medication. Well, there's a cost to that. That $50,000 isn't available to provide vaccinations 
for another group of people or other such drugs. But the point I was making here is in Australia, for instance, they had a deal where they said, look, we're going to pay a certain amount. It was almost a subscription (laughs) that they had for their hepatitis C medication. They said, we're going to pay X amount and you're going to treat as many people as we can bring in. And so that's one model. Other models are ROI models where, hey, you know, if the patient actually gets better, then we'll pay you for your medication. If they don't, we won't. But I think pharma really has to look at some of the pricing models and there's still plenty of money to be made because unfortunately, there's no shortage of sick people. But this era of we set the price for whatever we want and you pay for it and, you know, and it doesn't matter if the people who most need it can't afford it or not, is just not something that's going to continue to be feasible moving forward. And, And I do think you're seeing a lot of companies really thinking about these new pricing models and a lot of payers looking at these new models. Yeah. And full disclosure, I used to work at the company that you were negotiating with for those hepatitis C medications and, and worked on the commercial team, although... And I still do. And Ari still does. So we know that space fairly well. I, I will say I was not responsible for pricing decisions. That'll be my only get out of jail free card on that one, I suppose. But I certainly remember the challenges that you're describing. And you felt them on the clinical side, in the public health and healthcare resource utilization side of the the equation. And we certainly felt the same thing in trying to be more innovative in pricing strategies that solved more problems and opened up access for more patients. And the new era of that is the GLP agonist. Right. I was, yeah. yeah. And I really am concerned about these medications because what you're seeing right now is that people who have really good insurance or who know how to navigate the system or who are willing to pay out of pocket are the ones who are getting access to these amazing new medications. And they truly are amazing. I feel like every two weeks, some new study comes out that says something that these drugs are doing that we didn't know that they were doing that's positive for your health. Well, we know that we can't live in a world where 60 plus percent of the United States is overweight or obese and would technically qualify for these medications, but where the cost of them is going to be $1,000 a month for the rest of your life. Something's got to give there. But we also need to really think about a world where only the people who can afford it are able to reap the benefits of these new medications. That's not why any of us work for the companies that we work for or have worked for in the past is to increase disparities. But that's what's happening now due to, again, the current pricing structures that we have in this country. I want to go back to something you said earlier too. Dr. Adams, which is you have to look at people's health situation holistically, not just when an intervention is needed, but start at the beginning. What about prevention? But you don't get incentivized usually for preventing something from happening. It's mostly interventions are what physicians get paid on. Drugs are what companies get paid on. But you were very vocal about this even during the COVID epidemic, that you need to look at pre-existing conditions and other factors that make, for instance, you know, made the Black community much more affected. I mean, it was a disproportionate burden on the Black community with COVID. And you spoke up about that. And I got my hand slapped for it, which, which is unfortunate. You know, we are in a world where people too often do want to wait until there's a flat tire and then complain when they can't get, you know, a roadside service as opposed to rotating the tires and checking the tire pressure up front. I talk about this in my book. I very much try to lift up the fact that certain groups were at higher risk of negative outcomes from COVID. And we knew this because these are the same people who are at higher risk from the flu every year. They're people who have high blood pressure, who have diabetes, or people who who are overweight or obese. Unfortunately, it is a reality in our country that for reasons of which we can also go into, that minority populations have a higher incidence of these comorbidities. So I tried to raise this and to say to people, look, even as we're working to provide you with the tools to treat the disease, there are things that you can do to try to lower your risk of disease. Unfortunately, because of the politicization of COVID, I was accused of victim blaming. And it really had a chilling effect on our ability to talk about pre-existing conditions as a risk factor for COVID. It's an unfortunate legacy of 2020. You know, we had a once in a century pandemic superimposed on top of one of the most divisive presidential elections our country has ever seen. 
then you sprinkle on top of that a social justice movement unlike anything we've seen since the 1960s. So when you talk about people of color who are at higher risk for a disease, some people think you're talking about COVID. Other people think you're talking about Biden versus Trump. And other people think you're talking about George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery. <laughs> and, and that was the complex communications environment that we had in 2020 that poisoned the well for a lot of really necessary conversations that we needed to have then and that we need to have moving forward. Point I make the folks all the time, and this is not a political point, but we're shaping up to have Biden versus Trump all over again <laughs> in 2024, whether we want to or not. The last presidential debate of 2020 between Joe Biden and President Trump. Joe Biden said of 224,000 COVID deaths that had occurred at that point, any president responsible for this many deaths should resign, should no longer serve as president. You can look it up. He literally said it in the last presidential debate on October 20th of 2020. Well, fast forward to the end of 2021, you have vaccines available widely, you have PPE available widely, you have home testing available widely. How many deaths did we have? We had over 350,000 deaths under the Biden administration in their first year, despite having tools that we did not have in 2020. Fast forward to 2022, we actually had over 250,000 deaths. And so I don't make this point to criticize Joe Biden or the Biden administration. I make the point because the opinion, the feeling that changing the president and the FDA commissioner and the Surgeon General... <laughs> and the CDC director was going to change our COVID outcomes and trajectory has been proven statistically and categorically to be false. We're ignoring the larger issues at play here. And uh, Nari, as you mentioned, one of those big issues that I highlight is that as long as we have the burden of pre-existing disease in our country that we carry, that makes us one of the uh, worst performing countries in terms of health status of all developed nations, we're going to continue to get hit hard by COVID and by flu and by whatever uh, Mother Nature throws at us next. So are we having the conversations now that we need to have, like the conversation that you characterized as got some backlash or had your hand slapped for that because of all the complexities that were going on at that time? Is it better now? Are those conversations happening that you believe really need to be happening or do we still have a ways to go there? Because I, I still feel like maybe that's not occurring the way it should be. I don't think so. And that's literally why I wrote the book. I didn't write the book as a mea culpa. I didn't write the book, you know, to try to defend what, I mean, I'm very open about the mistakes that we made in 2020, but I also point out that, hey, those same mistakes were made by a completely different administration in 2021 and in 2022 and in 2023. Literally every COVID surge that comes, we throw our hands up in the air and go, no one could have seen this coming. Oh my gosh, who could have predicted this? That is why I wrote the book. And I worry that we're going again into a presidential election that because of the two people who were running, we're going to relitigate these same things all over again. But we really haven't gotten past the finger pointing. It's Trump's fault. It's Biden's fault. It's Tony Fauci's fault. No, it's Rochelle Walensky's fault. No, the problem is our system. W. Edwards Deming is a famous systems engineer who said every system is perfectly designed to get exactly the results that it gets. We have some of the poorest health of any developed nation. And it is because our system is perfectly designed to deliver the poorest health of any of the developed nations. I mean, you know, we spend two and a half times as much on healthcare as any other country in the world when you look at the OECD average, but yet we're ranked 20th or lower on most major health statistics, including infant mortality, including maternal mortality, markers of things that, that we really should be paying attention to. So to answer your question, Ian, no, we're not paying attention to it enough. That's why I wrote the book. And that's why I'm going to continue to spend the rest of my life trying to highlight the importance of getting upstream and preventing problems, the importance of fixing the system, as opposed to pointing fingers at individuals who uh, oftentimes are just a cog in the wheel of a machine that has gone awry. Another quote from W. Edwards Deming, a bad system will be a good person every time. And so it doesn't matter if you replace me or the current Surgeon General with the smartest, most well-intended person in the world. If they're functioning within a broken system, you're going to continue to have the same results. So we've all lived through history with COVID. And at some point, 
maybe you watched the same movie that I watched at the beginning of the pandemic, Contagion, which was almost like a script to what we went through. But at the end, vaccines were available and everything turned to the positive. That's not what happened for us. And I don't think anybody could have imagined, as you just alluded to, how politicized things became. And you in your role, it is always political, but the the way it was politicized was probably unprecedented. So you said you made mistakes. There were a lot of mistakes made, but I think the way that we experienced COVID, that was unavoidable. The science changed rapidly, or thinking changed rapidly. But at some point in the future, something like this might happen again. Oh, it will. But what have we learned, to your point, what can we take forward? Because as you said, we are in an imperfect system. You're trying to point out what your learnings were and what you as an individual were able to do. But again, it's a systematic issue. And we may not be able to change and improve the system in time to deal with the next global crisis. But what are some of the learnings that you think are applicable now? I love that question. And so in the end of my book, Crisis and Chaos, the final two chapters, one is focused on the individual and the other is focused on the system because we've got to do both. There are things that we can do at a governmental level and a a systemic level. There are things that we can do as individuals. So one of the things that I talk about that we need to do a better job of as individuals is recognizing when we're being fed misinformation on social media. So much of the vitriol and back and forth over COVID has to do with misinformation that people are consuming on social media. This is a systemic issue and an individual issue. We need to improve our health literacy. One of the reasons that we're ranked so poorly in health is because we're also ranked outside the top 20 in math and science (laughs) in terms of comparison to those other countries. So you can't have a complex conversation about new mRNA technology and about clinical trials and about different modalities that may or may not be beneficial and about the efficacy of masks with people who don't understand and who weren't taught how the scientific method works. Tony Fauci and I originally came out and told people not to wear masks. Why? Well, and I talk about this in the book, but it's really simple. We'd never told people to wear masks before because the advice was, if you're sick, stay home. It wasn't, if you're sick, put on a mask and go out. You can see when someone has the flu. They, you know, they've got a runny nose, they've got watery eyes, they're coughing, they're feeling bad. And we thought this virus was going to behave like the flu. Once the information got out of China that we were having up to 50% asymptomatic spread, then we had to change our recommendations. And that is literally how the scientific process works. You take the information you have in front of you, you make the best possible hypothesis and recommendation that you can, and then you continue to consume new information and to test out that theory. And if you find that that theory was wrong, then you change your hypothesis and your recommendations. That is literally what we did. But when we did it, everyone said, oh, you were lying to us. Oh, you can't be trusted. Well, that's partially on us from a communication standpoint. And I talk about how we could have been better communicators, Tony and I, and the public health community. But that's partially on a populace that doesn't understand that, hey, science isn't static. And shame on us if we think that you're supposed to have all the answers today and never change or never look for new information. So that's number one. Number two. And this was a big point in my book is we have to recognize our own political bias and how it shapes how we view information. So again, the politicization occurred because we had a presidential election in that year. Barack Obama had to deal with Ebola. And that was a big deal. We spent billions on Ebola preparation. There was a lot of the stigma and vitriol and involving people, particularly from Africa, during that time, the way that there was vitriol directed towards people from China during the the pandemic. But it didn't get politicized as a Democrat versus Republican issue because it wasn't in an election year. There wasn't really anything for, for, for either side to gain from politicizing it. But COVID very much became a political issue. And we started to consume information in a political way. I I want to give you a really quick example. I don't, I don't want to drag this out too much. Well, two quick examples. You talk about vaccine hesitancy. To this day, the highest ranked person to say they wouldn't trust a COVID vaccine wasn't Donald Trump. It was Kamala Harris. Kamala Harris said in a presidential debate 
a vice presidential debate against him, Mike Pence, and this is on record, I will not trust a vaccine that comes out under Donald Trump. And so that is literally, again, whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, that is literally the epitome of politicizing a scientific issue. I will not trust this vaccine, even if it's FDA approved. That's what she's saying. It's so in distrust in the FDA process. I will not trust this vaccine if it comes out under a Republican administration. But literally when they won, it was, hey, everyone go get vaccinated. Why won't you get vaccinated? We can't have our science politicized in that way. And and certainly, I want to be fair. Certainly Donald Trump and the Republicans did their part on the other side. But again, the you know, in an era of vaccine hesitancy, the highest ranking public official to say they wouldn't trust a COVID vaccine was actually Kamala Harris. Another quick story, when Joe Biden beat out Bernie Sanders for the uh, Democratic nomination for president, he said, the first thing I do when you elect me president will be to enact a national mask mandate. I had to go on the news a few days after that. And they said, do you agree with, with Joe Biden that there should be a national mask mandate? And what I said was, look, I agree that people should wear masks when they're in crowded places. And I explained the science behind masking and how it had changed. But I said, we don't have the federal authority to enforce a national mask mandate unless we're going to send out the U.S. Army (laughs) all across the country and have them detain people when they're not wearing masks. I said that, and I got ripped to shreds by Don Cheadle, an Avenger, by Axl Rose, a rock god by D.L. Hughley, a king of comedy. They called me horrible things because of what I said. Well, we're now almost four years into a Biden administration. Have we had a national mask mandate yet? No, why not? Because he does not have the authority to do it. So I literally told the truth, but it was viewed by people, not as scientific information coming from the Surgeon General, but as political pandering coming from Donald Trump's Surgeon General. And it impacted everything that we said. Tony Fauci and I still still marvel about this. Tony was viewed as leaning left. I was viewed as leaning right. Tony and I would get together every night and come up with talking points. And we would go out and say the exact same thing in the news every morning. There were multiple times we literally said the same things verbatim on different news channels. And Fox News would criticize Tony for whatever he said. And CNN and NBC would criticize me for whatever I said. And, and it was just amazing that how, how much we as a populace were convinced that we were consuming scientific information and that we were responding in a way that was very scientifically based. When the fact is we were responding in a way that was very politically based in terms of whether or not it was going to help Joe Biden or help Donald Trump. But here's the question, Dr. Adams. When science gets politicized like that, what happens is what we're seeing now. In 2021, there was a survey about the CDC, and 52% of respondents said they trusted the CDC a great deal or quite a lot. 20% said they did not trust it very much or not at all. In 2023, two years later, the number of people who trusted the CDC a great deal had come down to 37%. Another 37% they trusted it somewhat, and the number of people who said they don't trust it, or not very much at all, has increased from 20 to 26%. So the CDC is the leading public health agency in this country. If we have half of the population or more not trusting it, or not trusting it very much, that is a problem. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I do think that there were some self-inflicted wounds there with unclear communication, lack of sense of urgency, where information was communicated in a confusing way, too late. And that's where the misinformation came from, because then people were looking at other sources of, of trusted information or of information. And so how do we get to a place where for the next crisis, the CEC can be in that leadership role? Because obviously it's not going to work when you have this very chaotic or decentralized information flow from a public health perspective? So I've actually testified before Congress on this topic, and the answer is not to defund the CDC, as some people are calling for. 
one of the challenges that we have with the CDC is that they are not appropriately staffed or funded to do the task that they need to do. I mean, you have scientists and doctors who are used to presenting PowerPoint presentations that are 50 slides long, and you're throwing them in front of a camera without proper communications help, and you wonder why it's going bad. Joe Rogan is going to destroy anyone from the CDC because he's a professional communicator with a full team of people. This is another funny story that's not in the book, but I mention it all the time. Sanjay Gupta is a friend, and he explained what was going on in, the, in a COVID surge in a news special at one point, and everyone said, oh my gosh, Sanjay Gupta is amazing. This is fantastic. Well, you know, he had a team of people, professional communicators, who literally scripted out what he was going to say, who had graphics teed up to what he was going to say. He was being prompted by questions that he knew what was coming, and they were designed to highlight scientific information. And of course, it looked great. And yes, Sanjay is a great communicator. On top of all that, of course, it looked great. When we would deal with the media, it's okay, we're in a White House meeting all day long. We come out, we have five minutes to prepare. We've got no professional communications help. And then we're thrown in front of a hostile reporter. They don't want the headline to be Surgeon General or Tony Fauci gives great tips on how to stay safe from COVID. They want the headline, Trump Surgeon General contradicts what he just said about mask wearing. Completely different environments. And so we need to give the CDC the tools to be able to function appropriately in this media environment that, again, doesn't lend itself to PowerPoint presentations. You mentioned there were a lot of self-inflicted wounds. We have to own those wounds on the part of the CDC and public health. We've got to be able to give people practical information. We've got to actually listen to them. In many cases, we got on our high horse. And I say this today, I, you know, when I go back and forth with people on Twitter, and folks know I, I've got about 80,000 Twitter followers and more than most any other public official, I will actually engage with people and particularly people who I disagree with. But I think it's incredibly important that we do understand what people are feeling at the ground level. And we don't act like we can live in a world where everyone's going to walk around in hazmat suits 100% of the time, but also that we don't live in a world where we just say, okay, forget the vulnerable. We exist in that gray area. And far too often, public health exists not in a gray area, but in a world of perfection where the recommendations are, if you can't do it perfectly, then, then, then you might as well not do it at all. And that's not reality against the folks out there who say, well, you might as well not do it at all. <laughs> and that's gotten us to a place where we're over a million people who've died from a, you know, from a disease and many of those were preventable. And I think, as you said, the people on the ground, the people in the trenches, those are the, the unsung heroes. And if we don't give them the support they need to do their job in a way that it resonates with the public, then that's also extremely unfair to them because these people work very, very hard. They're amazing. They are amazing. And they truly are apolitical. Yeah. And you don't want to lose them because that's the, the vicious cycle, right? They get disillusioned, they're demoralized, they leave. And then the CDC or the public health institutions are even weaker than before because you, it's very hard to replace these people with you who have that kind of experience, that institutional knowledge. And a lot of them are leaving. A lot of them are leaving public health because they're tired of being criticized. They're tired of not having the resources to do their job well. And we're going to implode as a nation if we continue to see our public health infrastructure and our public servants whittled away. You can't undo this as quickly as, as we're tearing it down. But one really practical suggestion that I make in my book about the CDC director and the Surgeon General, they are appointments by the president, but they also serve at the pleasure of the president, meaning you can be fired at any time. One quick fix would be to say, okay, you're appointed by the president, just like a Supreme Court justice, but you serve a set term, period, point blank. You can step away from that term if you want, but you can't be fired, if you will. If we gave folks that protection, that would allow them to not only act independently of their administrations, because I, I know the folks under the Biden administration and I know the folks under the Trump administration. They worked hard to try to make decisions that truly were in the best interest and were apolitical. But no matter how hard you try, you're still perceived as being political when folks know that your livelihood depends on not pissing off the boss. And so it's a perception thing as much as it's a reality thing that if we gave people these terms, I think that would help instill trust in the CDC 
and in public health in a way that, that the, tr- the public will never trust him when, when they know that, hey, your, your governor's a Republican and you can be fired by, by that governor or by that president. And so, of course, you're going to do some, whatever they want you to do or vice versa if you're you know, working for a Democratic administration. I can't imagine everything that's been thrown at you, deserved or undeserved, maybe over that time period. <laughs> I think I saw an interview that you had done previously, and I think you described it as maybe having some PTSD coming out of that. And that doesn't surprise me to hear, although I, I don't like to hear it. But I, I do want to just recognize, and I love that you're so forthright in staying engaged, in interacting with the public. I think you said on, on Twitter in particular that's really commendable because it can't be easy. I'm sure there are times when you just rather not do that. It probably is easier maybe to retreat a little bit. But I love the idea that you're still out there and helping all of us understand these issues a little bit better. But I wanted to circle back to misinformation a little bit and take the other side of the table from from Nari, or at least an alternative consideration. And she describes some statistics around the reputational hit, let's say, that CDC and NIH and other public sector organizations have taken. And again, some deserve, some undeserved, Right. But a similar parallel exists on the pharma side as well. And so there's been a couple of polls that were done last year that kind of measured this. Gallup did a poll in August last year that showed that 58% of Americans had negative views of the pharma industry. Only 27% held positive views. This is actually the lowest ranking the industry has ever received since the poll began in 2001. The major contributing factors cited for the negative perception were high drug prices. We've talked about that. Uh, the opioid epidemic. I know that's a particular area of interest of, of yours. And the substantial lobbying efforts by the industry, which were deemed to be undue influence. There was a follow-up poll uh, around the same time period that showed that only 18% of Americans viewed the industry as positive. 60% had a negative view, similar. And this has declined significantly. There was a little bit of a bump in terms of a lift around reputation for companies like Pfizer during uh, Operation Warp Speed. But Once the vaccines were available and in the years since then, everything's kind of gone back to baseline or worse in terms of public perception. So the concern I have is, again, going back to this amazing accomplishment around Operation Warp Speed, the two large groups that brought that all about have really suffered in the public eye. And that's really a strange dynamic when you think about it. You know, on the one hand, we have this amazing solution. On the other hand, we're all unhappy and don't trust the organizations that brought about that solution. And maybe this gets back to the politicization issue you brought up, but it seems like we need to figure that out if we're going to place trust in the right places so we can get better solutions in the future. I couldn't agree with you more. And again, pandemic, politics, people grabbed onto symbols. Masks were a symbol. Vaccines are a symbol. And they're powerful symbols that people have wielded in order to make points and to gain inroads into new constituencies, whether they were political inroads or monetary inroads. So that is a challenge that we will continue to face. But uh, there's a saying that people need to know that you care before they care what you know. And it's why I'm on Twitter and why even when people approach me in a negative light, I will often still engage with them. Uh, You know, I, I tell folks, I'll give you three strikes. I understand you're angry. I'll hear you out. All right, one more before I will shut them down or or block them. But folks in many cases are angry for good reasons. And you have to show them that you care by by being there, by engaging with them. I think it also comes back to where we started, and that's inequity. People are going to be angry if they think there's something magnificent out there that you're producing that they don't have access to, that only the haves can get and the have-nots cannot. And I think that's a real challenge that the pharmaceutical industry is going to have to deal with. People are going to continue to see you as the bad guy when they know that the folks in the nice neighborhood can get the Ozempic and can get the Wagovi and can get the uh, Terzepatide and can be thin and beautiful and can have their diabetes treated successfully. Meanwhile, the have-nots can't get access to those medications. And that feeds that populism. That sets you up for someone who wants to then jump in to say, see, Those people don't care about you. They only care about the people who have money. And so I I think the inequity is at the core of a lot of that frustration and feeds into those sometimes negative populist um, attitudes about pharma and about government. People get frustrated when they feel like they're paying into a system and that system isn't giving them anything back in return. And so I do want to say that 
I work a lot with pharma and I really do feel like there is an intention to get more involved in community engagement. But I think it's it's got to be, it can't be fast enough and it can't be big enough because at the end of the day, we're behind the eight ball here. We're in a hole <laughs> that we're trying to dig ourselves out of. And so you've got to be present in the community again, not just to, to sell your drug, but to say, hey, we're Pfizer. Hey, we're Merck. Hey, we're Roche. Hey, we're Lilly. And we're here and we're not trying to sell you anything. <laughs> we just want to figure out how we can make the community a, a better place because when the community is doing better, we're going to do better. Lilly actually is great at this. I don't mean to, to pick on or, or, or lift up anyone in particular, but in Indianapolis, Lilly is based here. And so they have long had a commitment to investing in the community through their foundation work and beyond because they know that that's their workforce. <laughs> and uh, if their workforce isn't happy and healthy, then their company is not going to be happy and healthy. That's the point I made in my Surgeon General's report on community health and economic prosperity. And I think that pharma would do well to adopt this this approach and this attitude more more broadly that, hey, we have to build healthy communities. And if we do, it will come back around and we will benefit economically because the community is doing well. Dr. Adams, it's been a really incredibly interesting, informative an enlightening discussion with you. I wish we had 10 more hours with you, but... Well, you've got the book. <laughs> and it's not, even, it's not even 10 hours. Yeah. There's an audible version of the book. The audible version of the book is eight hours. So you can do it on a long road trip. <laughs> we have started listening to it. I have it on my audible. <laughs> yeah, I'll put that in the link in the show notes so people can find it for sure. Thank you again for taking time to speak with us today. You've had this very long and, and varied career, and we ask every guest, is there a particular person or an event or a motto that has guided you in your journey through your work and your life? Something that, in, especially in, in difficult times that you have experienced many of, helps you stay on the path that you're walking on? Great question. I am a Christian. And I often will say to people, no one in the Bible wanted to be where they were. Whether it was Moses or Jesus or Noah, they all said, why are you putting me here? Why are you putting me here? I, you, I'm not the right person. You know, you don't want me here. I can't tell you how many times I thought about that when I've been in tough situations, whether it was as Surgeon General or as Indiana State Health Commissioner, when I dealt with the largest HIV outbreak related to injection drug use. Or whether it's um, working in the hospital when you've got a really difficult case and you're frustrated because, you, you know, you don't feel like you can change this person's trajectory or improve their outcomes. But we all need to understand there is something positive we can do no matter who we are and no matter where we are for individuals and to try to change the system. No one person can change the system. It's going to take all of us doing our part. So that's one thing that I often personally think about that helps me stay stay grounded. But again, I said it earlier, I live by this. People need to know that you care before they care what you know. And I always try to create a connection with someone, find something in common with them before I start talking to them about something scientific or a health recommendation. I'm not going to come at you and say, hey, you need to get vaccinated. I'm going to find out what's important to you in your life. I love talking about my kids. Funny story that I think is a good one to close with a memorable moment from when I was Surgeon General. I was in the green room of an event with Bill Clinton. And we had both been warned not to talk to one another because I was Trump's Surgeon General and he was Bill Clinton. And we had both been warned, do not let anyone take a picture of the two of you together. And of course, both Bill Clinton and I are very social people and we find ourselves right next to one another. And what are we talking about? We're talking about our daughters. He's talking about Chelsea. I'm talking about my daughter, Millie. And I pull out my phone and I show him a picture of my eight-year-old daughter in the White House. She'd fallen asleep on this 200-year-old couch underneath Bill Clinton's official portrait. And I'm showing him that picture on my phone and someone snapped a picture of us in that moment. And I absolutely love that picture because it makes the point that no matter how different people try to convince you that you are, no matter how different people try to make you feel that you are from someone else, there will always be more that you have in common than there ever could be 
that will separate you if you only look for it. If you only look for it. If you look for the differences, they will be easy to pick out. Whether it's the color of your skin or the person you voted for or the part of the, the world that you live in, there will always be something that you can find that, that that's easy that, that makes you different. But underneath all that, we all have so much more in common than what, what could ever separate us. And I think as long as we remember that and start with that, then it, it will be easier to show people that we care and they will be more open to caring about what we know and hearing our perspective. Wonderful sentiment. Thank you so much for that. Very inspiring and moving. And I just love that thought. So thank you. And again, thank you for your time. This was a great discussion. Really appreciate it. For those of you that are interested, please check out Dr. Adams' book. It's a great read. Thank you, Dr. Adams. It was a pleasure. No, it was an absolute pleasure. Thank you both so much. And I hope we get a chance to have more conversations like this in the future. We need to. We need to talk about those underlying issues that go beyond Again, a lot of the finger pointing, a lot of the politicization, a lot of the misinformation, because if we don't, then we're all going to suffer. Wow, what an interesting guy. I mean, I really enjoyed that conversation. So generous with his time and just all these fascinating insights into kind of what was going on behind the scenes at, at various points of time that were critical to the country, critical to all of us. I think the thing that struck me maybe most, and there's a lot in there, but just how open and kind of vulnerable he was to the realities of the role that he was in and what he was tasked with doing and how he went about it and his approach and principles that guided him and how he tries to overcome these, what I think maybe we all struggle with to varying degrees, but overcoming the differences or perceived differences that might exist between different groups, however you want to characterize that. That's not an easy thing to do. He certainly was tasked with a much larger hill to climb than many of us in that respect. But I just wanted to recognize that he certainly seems to do it with a lot of grace and thinking about what's best for his patients and the public and putting that first and really just putting in the work. So really impressive gentleman and, and so glad we had the chance to chat with him today. I agree. I thought it was really inspirational to speak with Dr. Adams because... He really is so gracious. And as you said, very open and very transparent. And I think we can learn from that because, <laughs> as you mentioned, we're in the same boat. I mean, we, we in pharma also have a reputational issue. And there certainly are many things that are parallels to what he described. So I thought it was, it was quite humbling, really, to speak with him. And I also liked where we ended, which is really that more general sentiment of there's a lot of adversity, there's a lot of polarization, but the only way to move forward is really to try and build bridges, try to see each other as humans, try to find the commonalities and not so much focus on the differences. And I think just him being so engaged in the public space, though, I thought was amazing. I mean, as you said, right, we, we read that he publicly stated he, he has some PTSD from his time a certain general who could blame him, but he, he chose to still stay engaged and not retreat. I, I think that must take a lot of energy, but I think it's really commendable what he's doing. Yeah. Yeah. So much fun to chat with him. We'll definitely look to have him on again in the future. I think there's a few other topics we'd love to explore with Dr. Adams, but again, thank you, Nari. Wonderful discussion and look forward to the next episode. Likewise, Ian. Thank you for listening. Please visit us at realpharma.co for more valuable resources. Real Pharma is brought to you by Black Canyon Ventures. Ooh.